Can I welcome everyone to the 15th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices on to silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is our second evidence session of the committee's inquiry into teacher workforce planning for Scotland schools. The committee heard from a number of trainee teachers and qualified teachers last week. This week, we will consider the perspective of Teacher Education University, an education authority from an area where there are teacher shortages, a teaching union and a specific STEM subject shortage. Can I welcome Lawrence Finlay, Corporate Director, Education and Social Care in Murray Council, Dr Liz Lacken, Senior Lecturer on Education, Learned Societies Group on Scottish STEM Education, Jane Peckham, National Official of the NASWT, Dr Leslie Reid, Director of Undergraduate Studies, Murray House, and Dr Rowena Arshad, Head of Murray House School of Education, University of Edinburgh. Before we begin, can I thank you for taking the time to respond to the committee's request for views and for agreeing to give evidence. Can I also highlight that the committee will hear further evidence next week from unions and education authority and union university representative bodies. So there's no expectation that you're answering on behalf of all universities or all education authorities. That said, the detail of your organisation's perspective is very valuable a context for our work. As standard, I'll kick off with a general question on teacher training targets. What role do your organisations have in influencing the initial teacher education targets, and what are the issues that prevent some of those targets being met? Would anybody like to begin? Yeah, Dr. I think I should. Yes. Um, all teacher education institutions are part of the Scottish Teacher Workforce Planning Group, so we have conversations with the government um, at least two or three times a year about targets. Um, we generally have a discussion around December. I think it's not about the participation of those targets, it's actually the timing for us of when we get those targets agreed, which can be later than is desirable. So ideally, it'd be good to get the targets in December because we're already interviewing between January, February, March. Um, so we really need that earlier. I also think another route that um, is being developed and is one that I think is in process of growing is the teacher education partnerships working with our local authorities far more closely to identify local gaps and local pressures, pressure points. So those would be the two areas. Can, can I ask, sorry, just on that point about timing of targets, what's the the reason why you, you think the targets, the timing of the targets are pushed back to was it December? You well, it'd be useful to know it earlier because when you're interviewing and you get, you, you know, you get, for, for example, if you get 20 excellent um, physics, well, let's not take physics because that's a hard to recruit area, so I would suspect if you're getting 20, you, you get them all. But let's assume it's something that has a controlled number and actually you would like to be able to get more. Um, because we don't get our targets until about February or March each year, we don't know whether we can offer extra places or not. I think that's the issue. Because if we overshoot, um, we have a penalty. If we undershoot, we have a penalty. So... Um, Presentation is about the thing. Yeah, so actually having it earlier would actually assist us. OK, thank you. Sorry, uh, Dr. Lincoln. Yes. Um, as far as the learning society is concerned, we would really push for very strong and comprehensive evidence base as far as the targets are concerned. Um, so when you're putting together the, you know, when the workforce plan is put together, it needs to have a complete, um, reliable and accurate evidence base to draw on. So the, you know, the figures we're looking at, the vacancies, the shortages in, in subjects, not just STEM, but right the way across the board, so that these target figures do actually mean something and they can also be projected forward to the shortfalls as per Donaldson and what have you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fun uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, thank you. From a local uh, authority perspective, I think it's incumbent upon, upon us to work very closely with our local teacher training uh, institutes, uh, because if, if we are going to, to um, meet the demand for teachers that we have locally, we have to start identifying people locally who can become teachers in our area and to really build from the, the grassroots up. Uh, so if I can give you an example, uh, locally from Murray, we have a partnership with UHI, uh, where they've, they've trained primary teachers for a number of years and you know, through ongoing partnerships
partnership working, they've now expanded into secondary in critical subject areas, um, home economics, physics uh, and technological education, where we've been struggling to recruit. And again, we've worked in partnership to identify people locally um, who are willing to um, train as a teacher and then we're guaranteeing them, provided they pass their year, obviously, their training, a post in Murray for their, their newly qualified year. And I think that has to be the future. It's about developing local approaches to, um, to teacher training. Uh, there's a number of questions I'd like to ask around about that, but I'm going to leave it for my colleagues. And I think Tavish would like to come in very quickly. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt at all, Kavina, but um, just on the. So, is your assessment there that um, this national workforce planning regime, for want of a better word, uh, needs to be more localised? Your, your example, presumably, is the Northern Alliance or, the, or Murray yeah. specifically. And so, your take on that and then the, the Murray House take on that would be fascinating. Yeah, I, I think. I, I, very much just now, it's a local. We're doing it locally from a Murray perspective, but I know that my colleagues in Orkney are doing it with, with Orkney College and so on, and, and, and that's the case across the Northern Alliance. I think there's huge scope to develop um, a regional approach to, to teacher planning uh, for uh, planning for our future workforce, uh, and that could be done using the seven regional consortia that we Indeed. have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think it's a multi-pronged um, approach. I think one of the ways would be to work more locally to get local people interested in teaching and to convert that into actually people coming into the profession. But that is only one route. And I think if you're thinking, and that might be the case for people who are not wanting to change um, because they've got family circumstances or whatever, it suits them therefore to come in locally. But actually that's not true for people who have uh, moved for their undergraduate degree and have gone somewhere else. They might actually uh, be quite prepared to move into different geographic areas. And I think it's really important to balance so you have a multi-pronged approach because actually you do want more people to be socially mobile and to move, not least for the cultural uh, diversity of the area. So I think that is really important. So I think we've got to look at several fixes to that. Um, Lawrence's idea, but also looking beyond that. And I think we've got to think creatively, what is it that's stopping people from moving? So if it's the issue of um, expensive housing, then actually do we need to be thinking about some form of shared equity packages that actually assist people to move? Um, if it's to do with um, perhaps not having local networks, is there other ways that we can help people to, to settle and to stay? And that's the issue here, because I think the workforce targets has been really difficult and challenged to get to because we have no idea how people are going to change their lives. At the moment, I suspect young people coming in, particularly younger people who are not facing 40 years in teaching, are not going to stay in one place to teach. They're fairly mobile. That's the beauty and the, and, the, and the success of our system. So they're going to go to South Korea and work for a year or wherever, and then they're coming back, which is why I think returners to teaching is another very important route to consider. Thank you for that. I mean, I can't think of any region in Scotland that wouldn't benefit from Glaswegians going up to, to work in it. But, eh, uh, Peckham. Well, we don't have direct influence over the uh, targets and so on, but one of the points that we made was that there doesn't seem to be enough being done to promote teaching as a viable career um, in terms of uh, when you're contacting young students in schools. There are a lot of other professions and uh, uh, trades that are advertised even at, at career fairs and all the rest of it but very rarely do you see anyone standing promoting teaching as as a career and in terms of movement um we've had quite a few discussions with local authorities and with um councillors at various events and uh, although the preference waiver scheme was introduced to encourage movement and it could be adapted in some way perhaps uh, to be a bit more flexible. The problem is that people are not able to put down roots in one year, and then why would they uh, effectively take a salary hit the following year um, to stay in a more expensive place, for instance, than go back home? So I do think that there's quite a lot that could be looked at in terms of incentives for induction and, and probationers to encourage them to spread their wings more widely. Thank you. Before I bring in Ross Thompson, Julian, do you, you have a short That's supplementary? It's really coming off the back of, of what Dr Asha just said, and it's really a question for Lawrence Finlay. I, I believe that Murray Council did a scheme 
where they had affordable homes for, for teachers. Is, is that still ongoing? And no, that, was, that, a, that, that, work? that was a one-year um, programme where we developed a partnership with a local um, building contractor um, who were building new flats uh, in various locations in Murray, and they offered six months uh, rent-free accommodation. Um, it, it was successful. We did um, succeed in attracting a number of um, people to come to work in Murray. But more importantly than that, it also highlighted the issues that we faced, because we had a lot of public city around about it and um, so it, it, it got people more interested in potentially moving to rural Scotland so uh, it was a, it was a one-year fix short-term fix and it did work uh, and, and we are continuing to look at other programs similar to that which we might be able to to extend in future I just wanted okay. to know. thank you Ross Thank you very much, Convener. It has been a very interesting um, discussion already because the region I represent um, in the North East, um, as, as you're aware, just like Murray, has significant shortages in uh, teachers. Um, in, the, in our papers, um, there was a submission from the GTCS who suggested that actually there should be more work uh, with local authorities who have that greater insight into um, local need. So, for my understanding, how do you think that could work? What would a form more formalised structure look like? I mean, I, I know there might be relationships already, but what would best practice look like? What do you think would be a model that would really work to help ensure that kind of communication and, and that local need is met? I think, I mean, I think it's very difficult because, you, you know, every, every local authority will have their own individual issues. Some of, the, some of it will be to do with accessibility in terms of transport infrastructure. Some of it will be to, to do with the cost of housing. Um, and very often when people move, they move as a package. So someone moves and they have a spouse who's looking for work as well. And, 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 and that creates a whole other tension, another issue. And that's an increasing problem. But I do think across our local authority areas, we have different um, levels of expertise. Um, which we could perhaps pull together more effectively uh, into a consortia approach to work with the universities, to work with the General Teaching Council, to actually really get smarter at, at mapping out exactly what our needs are in terms of our, our future workforce, because they will be divergent across the, uh, across the regional areas. In terms of the, the preference waiver scheme, um, it does work. Uh, rural authorities do benefit from it. I would argue that it could be more preferential uh, to particularly rural authorities, uh, so people who tick the box to go anywhere. Um, there, there are some of these people that still end up in, in quite um, in, in central belt authorities, but there aren't the same staffing shortages. So I think we could make the preferential scheme a bit more preferential. Could I come in here, Ross, if you don't mind, just on that very point? I, mean, I, I saw you make those comments uh, in the press today. Whose responsibility would, would that be then? I mean, because it, it, surely if, the, if, if you're ticking a box saying you'll go anywhere, then somebody should be saying, well, that's what the shortage is. You're going there. Yeah. So I think that would have to be done on a partnership basis between the local authorities, the, um, the, the, the training institutions and the General Teaching Council. That would have to be done as a partnership approach to, to, to change how that's done. I don't know if Rena wants to come in with more information. Not on that point, but a little bit more on Ross's point. Um, the, one of the things that uh, is very practical, and I'll see if it works, returners to teaching is actually very big, because a lot of our workforce go away, uh, they've trained as teachers, and then they go somewhere else in the world or wherever, or they go to another profession, and then they find, actually, I want to come back to being education. And so the, we run a returner to teaching program, and we're about to put it all online as of September this year. I'm interested in approaching every single local authority in Scotland to say, will you consider investing X number of places? We're not charging a lot. We're probably in the region of £400 per, per person for the course fee, four five hundred. Because if you do, then you help us select to your gaps. And they then become people who are associated with your authority. We then can start networking them into your schools and networking them into the local area. That's an investment from the local authority. I don't think it's a lot. So if you, but I'll be, I'll be interested to approach ADES about that and see whether they'll take it up. It's a very practical option, actually. No, that's okay. No, thanks, convener. Um, when I asked the question um, to the trainee teachers about what was maybe preventing them from moving to, to other parts of Scotland, where there are vacancies, where there are jobs, um, one of the trainees said, well, actually, sometimes it's you know, his local authority took the decision to pay for um, his uh, PG, uh, PGDE. Um, but then when the other trainees said, well, actually, it's about the place, and maybe the um, authorities don't do enough to sell the place. So, I mean, would you accept that? Do you think sometimes we need to do more to sell the region to attract people to come up? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. We've done a number of things. We've, we've, we've had a, a YouTube video to, just to highlight how beautiful Murray is and what a fantastic area of the country it is and all the, the, the outdoor pursuits you can enjoy and how accessible it is to the, the, the bright lights of Inverness and Aberdeen as well. Um, but but I, I, I agree that the, the, the PR and the marketing around about this is, is, is a huge issue. And I, and, and I think all local authorities, particularly across the, the, the north and northeast, uh, do work very hard to try and um, really capitalise on all the advantages of the, re the, the area. And given some of the incentives that are in place, if you look at some of the submissions from, for example, Aberdeen City Council, Aberdeen Share Council yourselves, there's a number of things that are in place and every authority is different. So I suppose, should there be a more national approach, do you think, to some of these incentives? And then given, for example, at the North East, where you do have the downturn in oil and gas and some of the vacancies have been exacerbated, as you said, when a partner moves because they've been made redundant, you, you lose even more people. Should there be a national approach um, to incentives for... Um, new teachers. I think a national approach with then some uh, regional flexibility, I think, would, 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 would help hugely because we could end up in the, the situation where we're actually competing against each other, um, which, which isn't helping anybody and it's certainly not helping the children that are in the classrooms. So, um, you know, I, I could come out and, and go to my elected members and say, right, we're going to start offering a £7,000 relocation, then Aberdeenshire next week could trump that and offer £9,000. Um, you know, and, 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 and then you're just getting into silly games, really. Uh, so I think a a, a, a national position on incentives would be useful, but then some regional flexibility on how that's implemented. And last question, con convener. Um, in the Aberdeen City Council um, submission, they mentioned GTCS registration um, because they said that actually including candidates from elsewhere, even in the UK, it can be quite a protracted process um, and that they thought there's an opportunity to look at how that process could be made more flexible. Um, so I was looking to see if you shared that view and it, what measures you thought could be taken to actually make that more flexible. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a work in progress. I think a lot of good work has um, taken place in terms of introducing provisional registration. Uh, and that's helped us certainly from a Murray perspective where we've got a large proportion of uh, military families and military spouses, many of whom are teachers who have trained elsewhere. So provisional uh, registration has allowed us to recruit between 10 and 15 additional teachers in Murray. So for a small area, that's quite significant significant and that has really helped us. Um, we still get individual anecdotal evidence of some people saying the GTCS process take quite some time, but I think compared to what it was like a year or 18 months ago, there's been a huge improvement. Uh, so from, from, from um, that perspective, I would say it's, it's good work ongoing. Um, you had a very short... Yeah, so one of the suggestions from last week was that, that perhaps we should proactively recruit from communities where there are shortages, almost sort of, a, I think the proposition was, was almost headhunting people into the profession. Is that a suggestion you think that might have legs? If, if I can come in again on this one, I, I wrote to all parents in Murray in January of this year, and we have 12,000 school children in Murray, so it was quite a lot of letters uh, went out. Um, and from that, I had 165 responses to the letter. And basically, I was asking, are any of you uh, teachers? Have you previously trained in a previous life to be a teacher? Do you have any relatives elsewhere who would like to relocate and become a teacher in Murray? Uh, can we help in any way? And of those letters sent out, we had 165 responses, and we've managed to get, again, between 10 and 20 people um, either seeking uh, GTCS uh, registration, uh, provisional registration, or um, doing the Delight Scheme, the Distance Learning uh, Initial Teacher Education Scheme, which we are going to support them through uh, as a local authority. So, yeah, I think, I think being proactive and, and going out there, writing to people, is, is, is a good approach that can work. And you want to come in on this point? One of the things that came across last week in speaking to trainees, there was two kind of distinct groups. There was um, people who had worked in another job, not teachers, people who had trained and wanted to come back, but people who had done another job and wanted to come into teaching, and young people who wanted to do um, teaching. I, mean, I don't know whether Jane Peckham wants to respond to this, but is there a sense in which the system still really thinks of somebody coming out of university is available to go anywhere and is going to do this job forever? Because it feels like some of the barriers, if you were going to choose to do it once you're settled in a community and you've got a family, there's, the idea that you have to go anywhere or is very restricted seems to be problematic. So is there any thinking being done around actually different ways of looking at the times at which people will come into teaching? Yeah, I think so, Joanne. I think that um, actually quite a lot needs to be looked at in terms of um, the way that we've moved forward in making training to be more accessible to people from different backgrounds, maybe even you know single parent families and so on. Um, but the induction scheme is a one size fits all scheme, and it does not suit 
people with families who have mortgages and so on who might want to, to move. It doesn't. You cannot do induction on a part-time basis, for instance. And I think that we do need to start looking at how we can maintain the standards that are required, but offer much more access across the board. Because I think that part of our um, discussions with members have been the difficulty in being able to make choices after they've qualified um, and they are held back. So, yeah, I think a bit more needs to be done. Okay, thank you, uh, Ross. Thanks, conveners. One quite specific follow-up. Looking at the uh, shortfall in secondary uh, teaching by subject, the top two subjects are maths and technological studies, where there are obviously quite acute gender issues. And I was just wondering, Liz, given your uh, background in STEM, how much are the gender issues, like tech studies, it's uh, only one in four teachers currently in tech studies are women. How much is that acute issue putting them at the, the top of the list of, of subjects where there's a shortfall? Is the gender problem what's really behind that? Um, I, I don't think it's actually the gender problem behind it. It's the, the profile and the status of, of teaching itself. Um, if you consider that you know, there's a shortage as far as STEM graduates are concerned across the country, and um, you know, nationally and then internationally. But um, we've, so getting them into employment and, um, is, is an issue in its own right. Getting them then to, to consider teaching as a career is, is an even greater problem. And when you consider that um, courses in universities, education, unfortunately, is still considered the poor cousin. And we need to raise that profile. We need to recognise it as a profession. Um, and that way, raising its status so that people will be considering that, yes, this is the, the pathway we want to go. OK, so we are, have got competition in terms of, you know, STEM graduates wanting to go into industry where you've got much better salaries, which is what James was alluding to earlier. Um, that is an issue in its own right, but raising the profile, raising the status of education to attract these, these people is very important. So gender's part of it, but it's not the main issue, I don't think. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Julian. Um, yeah, I've got some questions around the, the content uh, design of uh, teacher training courses. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say, ask um, those present here that represent uh, the colleges um, what autonomy you have in terms of the design of your courses. Is the design of your course actually um, regulated or is it consistent across um, colleges? Or if you could explain that to me. So um, I think probably I should answer this one. Um, so our initial teacher education programmes are accredited by the GTCS. Um, they're uh, approved by all the university committees in terms of um, academic level um, and appropriateness of content. But the GTCS um, consider all proposals for new programmes and the balance of subject areas within that. Yeah, because there was, I mean, I, I would like to give the opportunity to respond to some of the evidence that we had last week, particularly from uh, graduates of, of Murray House that you're representing, Dr. Ashad. Um, particularly um, in the B.Ed., I think that, that one graduate said that she did not feel that there was enough emphasis on numeracy, and that was backed up by a couple of, of, her, of her colleagues on the panel. Um, and I would just like to give you the opportunity to respond to that. Well, I'll start and then you can maybe continue. I mean, I, absolutely, I did see that uh, response. And um, the thing is that I think you've got to go back to the fact that when they come in, they have to have attained, as you know, a CQF level five, which is a level that is far higher than what is required to teach primary school young people. There is, I think, an issue of numeracy confidence, not necessarily numeracy competence. So I think that's the first thing. The second is, of course, there will be people who have um, subject knowledge, um, perhaps their confidence level is lower. And that very same um, student of ours talked about a maths audit that actually we do provide, where students actually have to self evaluate where their strengths are and where their gaps are. And she said she did not find the audit helpful. Well, that might well have been the case for her, but actually we have evidence to show that actually many of our students who take it do find it very helpful because they actually get to identify their strengths, but also they get to identify where they need more work. So for example, last year we provided quite a lot of supplementary classes for those who have identified that they actually have some weaknesses. And when they come to that, those supplementary classes, they taught again 
how to teach the subject, because I think that's important. And in so doing, because you can teach um, a particular algorithm in many ways. You can say four times four is 16, but equally four plus four plus four plus four is also 16. So actually helping different pedagogical ways. So that those classes offer those kinds of um, examples. And in so doing, what the students tell us who've attended is that their own competence, their own confidence, their own subject knowledge also increases. So I think that's an example of one that I would use, but Leslie might be able to expand a bit more. I mean, I think just to give um, a little bit of detail on what actually happens in a mathematics pedagogy classroom, it might help. Um, I mean, I come from a primary teaching background myself, um, so, so feel qualified to talk about this. Um, so clearly, we are not teaching students who, are, who have um, National 5 mathematics. We're not teaching them things like calculus in initial teacher education for primary school teachers. So the level of subject knowledge that students need who are working in primary seven classrooms um, is the level that is uh, the, the, the level that the, the school children are learning, if you like. But that's a very different thing from the pedagogical subject knowledge that um, primary school teachers need. So the kind of activities we offer are naturally workshops and, uh, and lectures, but the, the kind of teaching that students experience um, in interactive workshops allows us, for example, to help them use children's misunderstandings as a natural part of teaching. Now, if you're using children's errors and children's misunderstandings, that requires a very different conceptual understanding of addition and subtraction. So the things that students are learning in initial teacher education are not higher level mathematical concepts, but rather a really in-depth understanding of lower level mathematical concepts. Now in our teaching, in initial teacher education, we would use those interactive workshops to explore student misunderstandings, thereby modelling how they would deal with children's misunderstandings. So it's quite a kind of complicated pedagogy that's adopted. It's not just about how good are you at calculus and therefore how good a mathematics teacher will you be in a primary school. Mm. Does although, that clarify a little? Yeah, although, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to emphasise that um, the Initial Teacher Education Programme is a partnership. It's a partnership between the school, between the student and between the university or the provider. And um, from that regard, we have the, the standards, that the, the um, GTCS standards of, profession, of um, provisional registration. Those standards are there for a purpose. They enable the student to be able to document where they actually are in terms of their progression through the programme. They're able to um, identify their goals for their various placements, and within that, their own subject knowledge and development. They are given opportunities throughout the process through like you were explaining, when they're in the, the university talk sessions, as well as when they're in school, to identify the opportunities are there. And it, it is an ongoing active process. It's not a passive process. So all partners are going to be involved. And I think that's a very important thing to remember. It's not just, you know, being um, uh, passively downloaded onto the students. When they're in class, they can't expect to do that with their own pupils. So they need to be actively identifying where their needs are and developing those from the opportunities they've got. So it is, and we help with that, both in school and at the university. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to add was also, because actually one of the issues that came up last week was the balance between being in university and being out on placement, on site learning. And I'm, we're modelling something that's new, that's coming up, uh, our Masters in Transformative Learning and Teaching, which actually is in your documentation, which is, I mean, all research tells us that actually spending time extensively in schools across your training or across your education programme is really important. So when we're setting this out now, we're looking at our site-based learning model, where it's two days in schools, or potentially three, but two, three at the moment, three back in the university. It's an every week 
it will be by and large like this. And I think that's a slightly different model to what we're having currently under block placements or individual threaded days in the school. New Zealand certainly has done that, and their students are showing certainly an ability to bridge that theory in practice. And I know because I reviewed initial teacher education in Auckland University in March, so I've spoken to some of these students myself. And I think that's it, because it's that constancy of ebb and flow. So here you are talking about the theoretical, the conceptual, practicing some of the issues that you're actually taking forward in a classroom. You're then going into schools within the week and seeing it and seeing whether it's done differently and coming back and saying, well, actually, that's the theory, but the practice is saying this. And I think it's that ebb and flow that's required on a regular basis. Um, and we'll see, but certainly international research tells us that that kind of site-based learning does work. So it's not an either or, it's a partnership, as you said, and it's both sides of the same coin. I suppose the thing is that it comes back to my original question as well, because one of the one of the, the, the people who gave evidence last week, not, not from many colleges I remember, said that there was a period of time where she was only in college and hadn't actually been able to apply that knowledge into a, a school and, and, and have that practical experience. And that comes back to the consistency across the colleges. You know, so if, 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 it's, if you don't want to be potluck which college you go to, you get a different type of approach that might work better to, to another. So, you know, how is good practice shared amongst, amongst the colleges and what works and what, what, what doesn't? Because um, that seemed really strange to me that you would spend a year in college and not actually access a school. I can't remember which college that was, but that was certainly some of the evidence that came forward. Mm -hmm. We are definitely in a period of transition with regard to the design of teacher education programmes. Um, all universities now are moving away from the block placement model where students spend a period of time in school with little interaction with university-based learning. So all universities are moving to more integrated models. There is variety in those integrated models and indeed that is encouraged by government who want to see a diversity of models of teacher education so that there is choice provided. Um, but the the original type that you were describing, the block placement model, is genuinely in a period of transition at the moment, as we seek better integration between university and placement learning. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Liz and then Tash. Thank you, Convener. And can I preface my remarks firstly to uh, acknowledge my membership of the GTCS, uh, but also to say that I think uh, from the witnesses that we heard last week, there were some uh, very positive things that they reported about teacher training, and I think it, we shouldn't forget that. Uh, nonetheless, um, I, I do think that some of the reports that they gave and some of the evidence that we have in our papers, as well as those who uh, provided evidence to us last week, there were some really shocking comments uh, about the standard of teacher training, particularly when it comes to literacy uh, and numeracy. And I find it very disturbing, and as I'm sure many parents would across Scotland, that we are finding it very difficult to know exactly how much uh, focus is put on literacy and numeracy within some of the courses, not all of them, but within some of the courses. Uh, I know I'm not the only member uh, who has tried to ascertain from the different teacher training institutions just how much of that focus um, is there. Uh, which is actually one of the reasons that the convener has had to ask specifically for us to be told now, do you find that that's disturbing, that we do not know how much time is being devoted to literacy and numeracy? Because, you know, the bottom line for any parent and any pupil is that if we cannot train our teachers properly in this area, what hope is there for our youngsters? Could I ask you to comment on that? Yeah, I'm going to start and then I'm going to pass to you. Um, I want to start by saying that I, I absolutely, I mean, I did listen to the evidence, so I do know what you're talking about and the concern. However, we have other sources of feedback as well, which I think is important. One of it is actually through our partnership with local authorities and head teachers in schools, and also the evaluation of Donaldson, actually, um, which is research-based, which actually tells us that actually, by and large, it is effective. So I think we have to actually, as you say, balance the comments that were heard by actually acknowledging that there are also many other sources of evidence that tell us, in fact, teacher education um, is operating well and effectively. Just to interrupt on that point, I mean, if, if you're a parent, you see declining standards in literacy and numeracy. 
uh, coming through on OECD material like from PISA, from SSLN, from some of the issues uh, in, in, in other measurements. And therefore, when you say that things are improving and getting better, that doesn't seem to fit with the evidence that is out there for the public. Could you explain exactly why you're of the opinion that there are some really good things happening? I think it's actually the way also literacy and numeracy is taught, which is where I was going to pass on to Leslie. So the actual average is not the only hours. It's, that's maybe where it's explicitly mentioned, this is a literacy, this is about numeracy, but it's actually how that's developed within the whole program. And that's something that perhaps other colleagues in the team also want to talk about or can say. I do think that the issue about the PISA side of it and those, uh, they are worrying, yes, but we've got to go back, I think, beyond also um, teacher education because there's something else happening. So the whole area needs to be looked at from early years all the way through to teacher education. I don't think it's just about the education of teachers, but uh, perhaps let's, um, Leslie, explain a wee bit more about how literacy and numeracy is developed. So it's threaded through with specific hours, but in other ways as well across the programme. I mean, we... we are providing the figures, the number of hours that students experience face-to-face -face teaching in the university, that's not a problem for us um, to do. The information is generally available um, publicly through the key information sets, but we, we're providing it in detail for you. But there is something that needs to be borne in mind when you think about face-to-face -face teaching um, that students experience. If students are undergoing an intensive PGDE programme, for example, they're timetabled very heavily in the 18 weeks that they're in faculty with us. There are very few hours in the day, actually, where they're not receiving some sort of input from the university. But any university course is premised on the idea that in order to earn 20 credits for a university course, that involves 200 hours of, of student effort. Now, for a student on uh, the PGDE primary programme, they may receive 45 hours of face-to-face -face teaching of that 200 hours. And that 200 hours, therefore, there's an expectation that students take increasing responsibility for their own learning. Now, some of that time, some of that remaining 150 hours might be spent on activities that are devised by staff in the university for students to engage with. But it's a very important part of anybody's professional development to learn how to analyse your own learning and reflect upon it um, and to act upon that. It's an absolutely integral part of professional, continuous professional development for teachers. It's an approach they will follow throughout their career. So our students are pretty busy when they're in the university, but there's also a high expectation that they will take part in um, their own professional learning in that way. Dr Reid, can I just pick you up on that? That's exactly what uh, Graham Donaldson uh, did say in mm -hmm. 2011. Absolutely. But, but he also said that in one of his recommendations that he believed that there had to be much more rigour about uh, when you accept uh, mm -hmm. students into teacher training about their uh, competence in literacy and numeracy. Yes. And that followed on, I think uh, I'm right in saying from a study that was done at Edinburgh University um, a couple of years uh, just before that, whereby there was a very worrying degree of the lack of uh, in-depth knowledge among some uh, teacher trainees about you know, basic grammar uh, and, in some cases, on numeracy. Now, these two things taken together, I, I think, is, is, is the main concern. And what, what we're really driving at here is that, given that the recommendations were made by Graham Donaldson and the Scottish Government uh, produced an update on, on the implementation of that in, in 2016, I come back to the original question. If these improvements are being made, why is it that we have trainees coming to this committee to tell us that in some cases they feel that that education is uh, failing in some degree? And secondly, why is it that we're not seeing some improvement in basic literacy and numeracy? That, that's the central concern. I mean, Dr Arshad has provided some answer there in, in saying that it needs to be looked at in a much wider context. I can describe the sort of pedagogy we adopt in initial teacher education. I've described how that works in mathematics, and it would work in a similar way in the teaching of literacy. So we have protected face-to-face um, -face contact between teacher educators 
and initial teacher education students so that we can unpack student teachers' misunderstandings of these issues. When you say misunderstandings, why are there misunderstandings? Is it not the job of the teacher training colleges in, in partnership with, with other stakeholders to ensure that those teachers, and I was struck last week by uh, just how uh, interested they were in becoming teachers and you know, the, the very considerable um, belief that it was a vocation and a very worthwhile vocation. Why is it that they are coming out without these necessary skills? That's the key problem. Well, I'm not convinced they are coming out with those um, necessary skills, but let's take the example of something like grammar teaching um, that you're talking about. So a student cannot come into initial teacher education without a higher English. So they have the understanding of grammar that they require to pass higher English. So that understanding should be sufficient in terms of knowing what um, sentence structure is, knowing what nouns, verbs and adjectives are. So they come in with that level of understanding into initial teacher education. But that's a very different thing from being able to teach mm -hmm. children about creating sentence structures. So initial teacher education is focused not on doing more about what a noun, verb and adjective is, but on unpacking those understandings so that student teachers can help children with those misunderstandings and teach them to create sentences in ways that are motivating and interesting. And I think this is a point that's also worth being made. A child will never write well unless they're motivated to write well. So one of the most important things we do in literacy teaching is to help student teachers learn how to teach things in motivating and engaging ways. So that is also a very important part of our pedagogy. Before I bring Tavish in, uh, one of the, the uh, witnesses last week, when they were talking about the, the issues that, that uh, Liz quite rightly raises, said that uh, for both literacy and numeracy, I think that you get immersed in it for one week out of the 18. You know, everything they do now, is that A, is that right, and B, is that adequate or is it, you know, one week out of 18? Well, that is not a model of initial teacher education that I would recognise, and I'm sure our representative from Dundee can echo that. Yeah. Um, what I would like to point out that was said through the evidence um, um, meeting last, last week was one of the students had actually said that um, uh, he felt that as far as literacy was concerned, he was immersed in it throughout his entire programme, which all the students would have been. They do have to submit written assignments. With those written assignments, they are picked up. And particularly, and I know from my own experience in, in the in institution I'm in, but I'm sure it's the same with yourselves, if there are flaws in their grammar, in their punctuation, in their sentence construction, etc., etc., they are then um, given advice to take that forward and offered support within the institution. Um, as far as numeracy is concerned, that, that's a slightly different issue. And I recognise, and I, rec I know that the um, Learned Societies Group recognise that there are problems with fundamental numeracy and I find it with my own students that those that have said that their own subject knowledge as far as numeracy is concerned is their limiting factor that's where they know they need to take that forward and seek help and seek advice and in the majority of cases they do but it is a learning curve you can't expect to come out of a program which maybe is a, you know a year-long program and then go straight into an environment like a primary school and be expected to teach the basic fundamentals of how to um, how to learn maths. Okay. So it is an ongoing process, it needs support as it goes through, and that needs to be recognised. Okay, so not you, just Tav. in the training programme itself. Sorry, sorry. Tavish? Thank you. Well, maybe just, just on the same theme then. So try, I'll try and ask this question in the positive sense. Um, are we getting it right at teacher training level on literacy and numeracy, or are there still things that you think we need to do more of? It's clear that we need, we need to do more, and we need to do more collectively. Yeah. And would you um, give us maybe a couple of examples of, of what those should be? Well, I would say particularly from a numeracy point of view, we need to look back at the very basics. We need to ensure that all the students are able to identify where their weaknesses are, where their misconceptions are. But they might not know that until yeah. they actually try and teach no, it indeed. to somebody else. Mm. And I'm not saying 
you know, learn in the classroom necessarily, but in our workshops we encourage them to do some micro-teaching, to teach to each other, and that way the peer support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that, that, mm -hmm. That's a way of actually taking it forward. Perhaps we do need to do more of that. And maybe I get the convenience point and the Smith's point, but um, obviously there's a lot of political focus around literacy and numeracy for good or ill, but, and, and that's why Liv Smith rightly made the point about these studies, both Scottish-wide and international as well. How does that come into your... Um, sphere of operation. I mean, I absolutely take the point there's wider issues about you know, younger age and so on and so forth and many other socioeconomic factors, but you're, our, you're teaching our, the next generation of teachers. We need you to do it. So how does how do we make sure you're, as it were, on it in terms of literacy and numeracy, given the political focus that's, that's there at the moment? So one of the ways, for example, that we're doing it is one of our colleagues is actually um, partly in the School of Mathematics in the University of Edinburgh. So drawing in our colleagues who maybe are their disciplines, um, expertise areas together with ours, so that if there are different ways of looking at mathematics and literacy, uh, sorry, numeracy, that we're partnering with them. So I think the university has got the potential to actually engage with its partner schools in that respect. Um, it, it's happening across all of our teaching universities? What's, I, I wouldn't know I, it's happening but, in ours. But who yeah. does keep an eye on that? I mean, I, I guess... I appreciate you represent mm -hmm. Murray House and Dundee, but are you conscious in your discussions with colleagues from across the sector, this is a priority and this is being carefully looked at in exactly the way you've just described? We do talk. We do talk, yeah. yeah. We do okay. recognise what the problems are. When yeah. something has got a high profile because yeah, of its exactly. political status, of course we, we sit back and we, we stand up rather than not sit back. We yeah. stand up and sort of okay. say, look, you know, what are we doing? And we are, we are proactive. It's, yeah. It is an, a no, classic example it's, it's of action. Questions research. for next week in some ways. But yeah. maybe I could ask two others. That uh, The first one's a general question that came out of one of the witnesses last week who said um, that on Curriculum for Excellence, uh, if we ask 100 teachers to define it, we'll get 100 different answers, which sure doesn't help any of us. Um, I wonder if you'd like to reflect on the challenges of Curriculum for Excellence, which has now been in place for 10 years, in terms of how you teach the next generation of teachers. I'll pass on to you, I think, on that one, Leslie. I think I would return to the comment I made on motivation, that the strength of Curriculum for Excellence, I believe, and the flexibility that it gives teachers will lead to better motivated pupils. And that is our, should be our primary concern yeah. because people who are not motivated will not learn. And that sure. choice and flexibility that Curriculum for Excellence offers in the primary school, um, I can't talk in, in such an informed way about the secondary curriculum, but in the primary school, I think it's working and I think children are enjoying learning. And I think that's, that's really important. I'd like to return to the point you were making about, are we getting it right? Um, and to assure in some ways that um, what we do in initial teacher education is as research informed as we can make it. So we are introducing students to the latest research in literacy and numeracy teaching. Um, we're engaging with them about the different ways that's put into practice in our schools so that whatever context they arrive in in school, if they're faced with a reading scheme that doesn't seem to them to be very motivating and exciting, that they can use that research-informed approach to use that scheme in the best way to motivate children to learn. So that research-informed view um, and process of what we do is absolutely fun fundamental to initial teacher education. Okay. One last question, if I may, Kavina. Um, the other question that I raised with witnesses last week was about internet security in the changing world we live in, and, and they all observed that that was not part of uh, how they learn to be a teacher at the mo uh, 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 through their courses. And we've asked, obviously, the government, the government rightly have said there's some work to be done with, if I may say, say all of you. Do you accept that um, our kids now all sit on mobile phones all the time? There are some enormous positives to that, and there are some big challenges to it as a father of teenage children. Um, what are you going to do about it? What, what, what will we teach in future to help our teachers deal with the reality of internet safety? Absolutely. Uh, I think data literacy of that kind in online securities, etc., are very important, and it's an area that we could all do better on. Um, that I think I'll say that from the outset. My concern, of course, is actually, it's not a concern, it's that my hearts and minds 
helping colleagues to also think here about, because they have a pressure on literacy, they have a pressure on numeracy, they've got well-being, they've got all sorts of things to be, sustainability, you name it, it's all there. And it's all got to be crammed into that very short time. And that's why I think, you know, and, I, and, and so this is an area that I have said from the outset, since I became head of school, it's really important that we put it in. I don't think we put it in as much as we would like to, so it's an area for improvement, absolutely accept that. Um, the other thing that I think is important, and it's slightly moving away from your question, but it's about the term training. I've noticed that consistently colleagues have been using the term teacher training. We use the term in the sector teacher education. And the reason we say that is because actually it's not a training in the sense that you would robotically train people to do A, B and C in a particular way. And that is really important because curriculum for excellence is one framework. These teachers are going to have lots of different curriculum frameworks over the lifetime of their study. They have to be agentic, they have to be adaptive teachers. If they cannot do that, then we've got a problem that we're storing up for the years to come. So I think that's, so in terms of is curriculum for excellence effective or not, is it as effective or it can be if the teachers themselves are able to be agentic and adaptive. If they can't, then they're going to th go through a tramline robotic approach to it, um, unable to see beyond, inter uh, siloed, not interdisciplinary. We need people like that. Our, own, our only resource in this small country like ours is our people. We've got to actually get people who are able to compete in the 21st century. So I think that's really important. I agree with that. What I would like to say is that we had a classic example last week. The student who responded to your question, she said that um, she had she had conducted a lesson about internet security and she'd done it off her own volition. Now, one of the big problems with the way that Curriculum for Excellence is put out there is that it is perceived to be, or um, it's prescriptive. And rather than trying to emphasize the aspects of the, of the interdisciplinary aspects of the Curriculum for Excellence, all the good qualities of it, by squashing it, by saying, you know, we've got to try and get so much on literacy, numeracy, everything else into the time that's available. What we're trying to do is to enable these students, exactly as you were saying, to actually be professionals in their own right. They're the ones who know what the real problems are on the ground, and that student was a case in point. I saw um, one of my own students in school last week, and she said exactly the same. She had conducted, because I was asking her about evidence against the, um, the professional values aspect of the standards, and she was saying, well, she conducted a, a session on internet security because she had overheard some of the children in her class talking about aspects that she thought, oh, wow, we need to squash this one. That was her professionalism coming through. Now, that comes as part and parcel of the whole course, the whole program, and students being proactive. Yeah, get that. Thank you. Good. I'm sitting here quietly because I'm finding this really interesting because we do quite a lot of work uh, with uh, newly qualified going into induction. And I haven't yet heard any of the students complaining about the level of literacy and numeracy training, but they do absolutely emphasise their feeling of um, lack of uh, confidence in going into the workplace because they haven't been taught uh, enough behaviour management about things like internet safety but also how to teach a child with additional support needs mm -hmm. and one of the other issues that, that comes out of this that would help to build confidence and I completely accept that the more we have school experience tied in with learning I think would be a huge advantage I mean I vividly remember coming out as a primary teacher myself and I won't tell you how long ago but I literally felt like my first day in my classroom was my first day of learning how to be a teacher um, so we need to look at that but all of the resources that would give teachers the confidence in um, addressing all the grammatical things all the literacy things how to teach internet safety and all the rest there's nothing there now you mentioned reading schemes and a lot of our members no longer have reading schemes because there's no investment in the resources that teachers and students need, nor has there been uh, any investment, quite the opposite, in terms of support that teachers um, should have to allow them to get on with the job of teaching and learning. And that, I think, is at the crux of the issue. So, I mean, really almost it doesn't matter how much training a teacher gets at university level if the support systems and the resources are not in place for them when they finally get to do the job. It's extremely damaging. Um, and it also doesn't allow the curriculum to flourish in the way that it's been intended to do. Just one final um, comment, I think, on, on the internet safety thing. 
and linking that to the teaching of literacy. One of the challenges we face in the teaching of literacy is, of course, that we're not simply teaching students to help children decode um, in terms of reading, the, the mechanics of reading, but also to help children approach the, the uh, media texts that they, they come across all of the time because of the, the balance of things that children are reading very much. Nowadays, many of them are digital texts, so, so that is an issue. So using those digital texts as part of our teaching is important. But behind all of that, one of the most important things we teach in literacy is to teach critical literacy skills to the children, so that to the students, so they are then able to teach those to the children. Um, so to approach a text in a critical way is a fundamental part of internet safety, in other words. Um, having said that, when I was collating the figures um, that, that were asked for on internet safety, most of the programme directors I approached said, yes, as Dr Ashad has said, we're not doing enough on this. Um, but I think it does have to be framed within that wider picture of a critical literacy approach to all texts, including digital texts. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne, did you have a supplementary? Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in, in you know, I hear absolutely that a young person has to be motivated in order to write, and, and I um, plead in, in evidence that I was a, an English teacher for 20 years. And that balance between saying, well, these are the rules, but we don't want to inhibit you in, in writing and so on, um, I get that. But I wonder whether, I think, post my time teaching, there was more of an understanding that kids actually did need to hook into rules and it helped them and it gave them confidence. I, want, I mean, I'm a generation that parsed in primary school, so I was quite relieved when we stopped doing that. But if, as a higher English, is this, the level of literacy that required now, is there academic work being done in looking at whether the levels of confidence in literacy around a current higher is the same as it would have been five years ago? Ten years ago, we've had some... I've had anecdotal evidence in talking to people who work in, in universities who've seen the level of competence amongst young people coming into university is lower than it was. So just to say that a, a, a teacher coming in with a higher English is not necessarily mean that they have the confidence and competence in literacy that they might have had 10 years ago. And I, I'm interested yeah. if there's academic work around this, because I think there is a lot of political interest, but it would be helped if there was a academic work looking at this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's a very relevant point. One answer, of course, is that Learning and literacy, the one I've just given really, is a very different thing from what it was 10 years ago and that students are coming in with much greater proficiency in digital texts that's not always recognised, for example, in the higher English qualification, but that they need to, to become good primary school teachers or good secondary school teachers. Um, in terms of what's involved in being proficient in literacy, of course, in writing, children have to have a good command of, of vocabulary. They have to know how to organise their thoughts in writing, as well as all the technical skills of spelling and grammar and punctuation. Um, so they need to know all of these things, as well as all the challenges of the new digital world. And it perhaps just allows me to make a general point about teacher education in that we are preparing teachers for an unknown world. The world has changed enormously in the past 10 years that you're um, referring to. Um, but it's therefore really important that we do cover all the things that we're talking about in detail, the numeracy and literacy skills, literacy skills that are required. But fundamentally, our teachers are going to need enormous resilience to cope with um, the children in, a, in the schools of the future and to help them survive and cope in that. So it all has to be framed in that bigger picture, Maybe I think. Just before, before you come and ask this, also this point, and you can respond to it, that um, one of the things that did come out last week was this sense, and we said it, I said it 35 years ago when I was training, there was too much um, theory and not enough hands-on practice. And you say that's training. But do you not accept that actually some of it is training? You don't have to be a robot, but good classroom management rather than having to learn it, you know, reinventing the wheel every time a student goes in or a new teacher goes in. Is that work being done? And also to the point about reading schemes. In Curriculum for Excellence, would you still have something, maybe not in these terms, that we would have had a school-wide policy around 
marking or what you encourage around literacy and numeracy. Are these things still encouraged in Curriculum for Excellence so that um, while, yes, you, 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 you create and you innovate and you energise and you motivate, there are still basic things that the young people can refer to and that teachers can refer to in terms of developing their confidence, which I think is pretty central. There are several. We've got lots of questions there in what you've just said. Um, I want to go back to your first one about the research, because basically you're saying, you know, what evidence is there that higher English will, is, is sufficient to actually enable our student teachers, because we're in education, to be the marker, to know that, you know, that there'll be literacy level. Actually, I personally do not know of any research that. So you're, you're talking about, is it better now or is it worse now? I actually don't know if what research there is that says higher English is the marker, is the signifier that you are therefore more capable, therefore, to teach literacy. And I, 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 so, so, so that's actually a question in its own right that I'm saying I don't know. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But that's a quite important question because it's being used as the signal to say that that's mm -hmm. what we need mm -hmm. in order to have this level of uh, competency for being teacher education. So that's a quite a fundamental question that I think um, I would certainly be wanting to dig a bit more after this committee. The second thing you were saying about, you know, is, is where's the balance between training and education? And I guess it's not about that robotic training. So I, I noticed one of the things people said was, you know, there's not sufficient to support children with autism. Um, that was another one that came up, I think, last week. And actually, you could put an N and N because within the time frame, what is really important is to actually get young, uh, the, the student, the, the, the teachers who are in, the student teachers, to be thinking about, for a start, having a disposition that does not see the child as a deficit. That's a value-based thing, because that still exists. That problem child with English as an additional language, or that problem child with whatever. So that's a mind frame thing. So we actually have to set a framework of values and approaches. After that, I think we've got to actually give them some fundamentals of how to actually engage with this classroom management. And actually also getting it thinking in terms of, instead of behaviour management, to be thinking about perhaps it's about relationship management. Getting them to think differently about situations. Now we can give them those building blocks. I think that's the important bit. How we populate those and how they do it, only they can do it. Because if I teach somebody how to actually react to a child with autism, but actually it's not the autism that's the issue, is that perhaps it's English as additional language that might be the issue alongside the autism. If I do it in one track way without them seeing it in a more intersectional way, then I've got a problem potentially because it could be mixed diagnosis coming in, a misrecognition. So I think that's something we really need to do and keep doing much more of. It's a bit like that AA advert. I don't know how to solve that, but I know somebody who does. So they need to know what the support structures are, what the frameworks are, who to go to, and who they call, and at what point they actually say, well, actually, I need some support and assistance on this. That predicates on the fact that there is that support network and assistance. So I think it's really difficult, because when I was thinking about the autism one, I can immediately see other communities coming and saying, what about us, what about us, what about us? We can't possibly consider all the conglomerations, but we have to give a framework whereby at least you've got your top 10 ideas of how you might pull some of those toolkits out of the tools, out of the toolbox. But it's not going to be a complete one. Uh, very briefly, please. Just to respond on the behaviour management side of things as well. Yes, outages are devoted in the university to the helping students with behaviour management issues. They are taught a positive behaviour management approach that research tells us works best with children um, and avoids damaging children. That's an important one there. Um, students are taught about that general philosophy. It is relationship-based. It must be in the modern world. It must be relationship-based rather than um, disciplinarian. They're also taught about the initiatives that are used in local authorities and schools um, in wide-ranging ways so that they can compare and contrast those. Um, they're given practical strategies to help them with behaviour management. When they go into schools on placement, they are assessed on their behaviour management skills um, and supported by the classroom teachers with the individual classroom context that they're working in. So I believe it's approached in many different ways with students, but it is something we take very seriously because we have to. If, if, if students can't um, control the behaviour and help children with their behaviour in class, then they're, they're unable to teach. 
Okay, thank you. Daniel? Um, yes, I, mean, I, I think curriculum for excellence is, a, is, is very ambitious. It, it's broad, it, it's, it's about join, joined up learning. Um, that obviously is, a, 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 is a, a challenge for initial teacher education. I was just wondering if the panel could reflect on, on how IT has changed as a response to curriculum for excellence uh, over recent years. There have been many developments in degree design since the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence. Um, so some of them have involved in the primary school a move away from teaching in discrete subject areas. So there's been a greater emphasis, for example, on interdisciplinary learning um, that's seen as highly motivating for children. That's been a challenge, but something that has resulted in a lot of very creative teaching. Every year at the end of our PGDE primary programme, students come back and give presentations on interdisciplinary learning experiences that they've enabled in school. These are jointly assessed by head teachers and members of university staff um, and, and are genuinely examples of very high quality teaching. Another development, I would say, in relation to Curriculum for Excellence and how that's impacted on what we do in the university is the different ways in which we look at assessment. So along with Curriculum for Excellence came um, the developments of the Assessment is for Learning programme in Scotland that um, have prioritised the benefits of formative assessment, so using assessment to genuinely enhance Pupil learning has been something that's been a shift um, in, in universities since Curriculum for Excellence was introduced. Yeah, if I can just come in here, I, I would say one of the most positive uh, moves in ITE has been the, the, the fact that it's more of a partnership now between the, the uh, institutions and between local authorities and schools. If I, if I think back to graduating as a young teacher myself, I, you, I was very much left to get on with it. Uh, whereas now, with the best will in the world, there is only so much that can be done in a PGDE year. Mm -hmm. and, and I think within a local authority, working closely with our partners, in our case with UHI and with Aberdeen specifically, we can then model the, the ongoing teacher education that's required throughout year one uh, of a teacher's career, then years two to five, and so on and so forth. So, so one of the first things we cover when, when teachers come to us for their induction year is, is internet security and, and how you approach that in the classroom, how you approach ASN, how you approach um, behaviour management, positive behaviour management. And that is a one-off, but on an ongoing basis throughout their induction year. And then looking at opportunities to, to, to develop uh, career-long approaches to professional learning throughout a teacher's career. And I think that's a big shift there's been a big shift in the last 10 years of CFE, and I think it's a very welcome one. So, so um, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to say that um, from our point of view, um, we look at uh, the interdisciplinary learning side of things, as was mentioned before, but also the transition phases. So there's a, a big emphasis on that. So when, when I trained as a teacher, I was in secondary, and we were very much in our own silo, and I was biology, so we were in my own silo, if you like, within the sciences and within the STEM subjects. Now we break that down, so we have our STEM students together. We also have our primary and our secondary students. There are times when there's crossovers there as well. And this is all as a result of Curriculum for Excellence and the, the emphasis that that's brought through. So one of the comments that came out last week, and it, it wasn't a new one to me, is that there's an overemphasis on, on theory and, 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 and maybe less of an emphasis on, on technique, and technique very much being that bridge between the theory and, 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 and the practical uh, placements that, that students are doing. Is, is there a danger that in preparing teachers with this sort of thinking about how to think about education, that, that we, we've lost some of that technique? Is that, is that uh, a concern? The biggest question I would always want a student teacher to be able to answer when I'm watching them teach in the classroom is, why are you doing that in that way? If you don't know the answer to the why question, then you won't know what to do appropriately when something goes wrong. And the theoretical, or what you're calling the theoretical aspects of education, um, provide that answer. So at the end of that year, we are asking teachers, albeit on a probationer, to stand in front of a class on their own. And so while they might be able to ask the why question, there's the how question. 
you know, and, and, and is, there a, is there a concern that they're, they're, they're not there yet? And I would, I'd say it's interesting listening to Liz Lakin's point about maybe needing to have teachers practice on teaching one another and some of those sort of actually practical experimentation. With t t and that, that, to my ear, sounded like a need to focus on, on, on technique. So I, I, I don't disagree, but it, the why can't be to the exclusion of how, surely. Absolutely not. I'm with you there. We need to do both. So, uh, given the, the breadth, it strikes me that we have to cover a lot more with initial teacher education. Would, would that be correct? And, and are we... How, how much of a problem is it in terms of the, the, the provision of CPD or lack thereof? You know, no one is expecting a, a fully formed teacher to be spat out at the end of ITE. So they're going to actually have to do most of the acquisition once they're in the job. It, it is, what there, is there adequate to do that? Good question. I think. Yeah, I'll, again, another several layered question there. I mean, the thing about, sorry, you talked about, well, what I jotted down here was outdoor and literacy. Um, why did I do that? I wanted to give you an example of actually peer learning is actually also important as an approach. So if you think about, um, if, if children are to be motivated for learning, Outdoors is actually one of the great ways to get them motivated because they like being out and it's actually good for them to be out. Um, but within that, you can actually have some literacy sessions and lessons. So the way we're doing it with our students to, um, is we, we video a, a lecture so they can watch it, so they don't spend time with their tutor being lectured at or lectured with. They then look at the lecture, and this is a flipped classroom approach. So they then come back in and they talk to each other about what they've heard. They maybe then go out and do their two days on placement, say, and they come back and they say, well, in my school, we don't use the reading schemes, we do it like this. And then they oh, in my school, we do it like this. So actually they're sharing also the how of how it's being done and they're evaluating that against the readings and the video lecture that they've had. So it is a different form of learning. It's about using peers. So that's maybe, a, and, and it's also bringing in the outdoors here. So you're effectively double dividending on it. And I think that's important if time is short. The second thing that you then said was, um, about the CPD, there was something else you said in between, but I wasn't fast enough to catch it. Um, but the CPD aspects, I think, yes, that, that is very important, and that is something where the local authority partners, uh, for example, in the UOE Teacher Education Partnership, we realised that we had six authority partners, and they were each offering their CPD, and they were each offering things, and we realised that actually as a partnership, we could, we shouldn't be doubling up on this, and every authority offering X. So we agreed that actually, let's just agree that if X is being offered in one authority, the other five can come to it too. And therefore we have more of a menu. So that's not saying about the time that people would give and how that's going to be paid for. This, uh, that's all of this at the moment was sponsored, um, paid for by the Scottish Government as trialling to see if there's a different way we can approach DPD and to get people engaged in that next stage of the professional learning, lifelong learning part of it. But there was a bit in the middle that's annoying me as to what you asked and I forgot. Yeah, can I, can I just come back to this business about thinking about the how? Yes. Um, I think we've got to remember that there are, very, there are several different ways of arriving at an answer. And um, one of the pushes we have in um, initial, teacher train, uh, initial teacher education and um, education per se is to think about the process that you're involved in, in your learning. Think about how you've actually arrived at the answer. And maths is a case in point. Um, one of the things we encourage our students to think about is um, to ask the children about the different routes that they've taken to actually come up with an answer in maths. And there are many different ways. And without thinking about that and without able to identify that, we, can't, we, we won't be able to take on board that people learn in different ways. I totally accept that, but I think the best way of really gaining that understanding is to be an expert. You know, if you're proficient in a technique or multiple techniques, that's the best way that you can really step back and examine how. I mean, it, you, you don't, you don't, we don't, we ask driving instructors to be able to teach driving by, by, by demonstrating their, 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 their driving skills first and then reflecting back on that. I think to, to, to look at the, those why questions from a purely conceptual basis without that expertise surely that's quite limited except that we're living it every day and um unless you take your lived experiences you're not it's not really going to mean anything we can then bring the expertise in and actually make it 
and, and mean something and have sense, if you like, and then use it for later, further experiences. But we, I mean, we're, we're trying to encourage our students to be reflective practitioners all the way through. They're not experts until they've actually spent some time doing the job, if you like. And this is why the career long learning is so important. I mean, the emphasis is on learning all the time, and we carry on learning. And you can't really learn until you can stand back and sort of say, OK, how did I do that? What went wrong? What was good about that? Did it work? Did, you know, were the children engaged? Did they actually understand? Have I got evidence of that understanding? That's one of the biggest problems that the teacher may find, is to actually give, get the evidence, and real evidence, that the children are progressing. OK, thank you. Liz, you, you've got a short... Yeah, very small, uh, short question. You've talked about the how and the why, which are absolutely essential. What about the question over what they are learning? Because there are some who will criticise the curriculum for excellence because they don't feel that the knowledge content is sufficiently rigorous. Could you respond to that? I would certainly think depth is important as well as breadth. And one of the ways uh, that the universities, and I think Donaldson did say that, that actually we need to do, reach out a lot more to various other groupings in the university to populate that depth knowledge as well. So the, the what and the depth, I think, are the two things that is important, not decrying that. Um, I also think that who we partner with in the learning uh, could be improved as well broadened, um, whether that's learning from industry, people in industry, or whether that's learning from people in the third sector. I think actually um, teacher education has done very well. It could do better in broadening, I think, the input that comes into it from different sources. So for example, within, I suspect, all teacher education establishments now, um, there are people who come from a very education background, but there are also people who come from other subject area backgrounds and other work backgrounds um, as well, because one of the things that worries me, um, or has been, and it doesn't happen now, is what we see as APL, what, what are the prior learnings that's seen as good credentials to become a teacher, and we th I think we could look a bit more creatively on that. Um, I've had one student who well, as, heads of, as a head of school, I get complaints of people come in when they say, well, I've not been selected to enter your course. So I get that kind of letter. And one of them was actually somebody said, well, I haven't spent time in a primary school before I applied to be a primary teacher, but I've spent a lot of time working in youth work in Pilton. Why is my experience not actually seen as the same? And it's not the same, but there are transferable learnings from it. And these are the kinds of things we've got to hone in on a bit more. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ross. Thanks. I'd like to explore additional support needs in initial education a little bit more. And uh, Dr. Arshad, you made a very good point a moment ago about the need to take an intersectional approach to it. Um, when you've got one in four kids with additional support needs, that's obviously a massive spectrum. And we don't expect every teacher to be an expert in every kind of uh, additional need. But from the evidence that we've received so far, there is a, a huge inconsistency between institutions, between courses, and how well equipped new teachers actually are. Is there a need for more consistency between institutions and courses on this? And is there a role for the GTCS to beef up their guidance on it? Well, of course, coming from an equalities area, I would say yes, wouldn't I? Um, but that's because I'm biased, so I will declare that from the outset. Um, I, I think it is very important for, I think student teachers to be thinking a lot more about the diversities in their classroom. And this is where additional support needs comes in. And, but for me, the fundamental was what I said a while back, which is actually even getting past that hurdle of seeing somebody who is different or who doesn't fit in as a deficit. I still think, and that's a personal view, so I'm not speaking on behalf of all, any of my colleagues, but uh, my personal view is there's still a mindset to move forward on that. So can the GTCS offer more guidance? I think they offer a lot. I think they are trying to relook at their professional standards at the moment, professional values. Um, I think they've done a lot actually to contribute to this area. Um, what more can be done? Of course more can be done. But whether it's the GTC alone or whether actually it's, for me, it's about mainstreaming aspects of additional support needs about uh, equalities issues into the teaching of literacy, into the numeracy, into um, data literacy, into well-being, uh, and not just seeing it as a well-being issue. Yeah, 
Thank you, Convener. I think this is a huge uh, challenge for us moving forward. Within my lo own local authority area, we've seen a 124% increase in the number of young people registered with additional support needs since the legislation was updated in 2009. We expect a lot of teacher education, and we've discussed that already in terms of initial teacher education, what it looks like, what the content is. But we are experiencing young people coming to our schools with increasingly complex uh, and challenging conditions, and teachers need to be able to, to support that. Uh, and, and I think that's an area where, for a, from a local authority perspective, there are huge risks, um, and, and, and I think there needs to be a wider conversation around about how that is how that is remedied and, and, and how we can work in partnership to ensure that training is in place to give teachers the confidence to to, to work with these young people. Okay, thank you, Jane. Yeah, and additional support needs in all its many contexts. It's it's, it's quite a complex area, and the, the issue for students is that you could never teach them about everything that would be required because each individual situation is different. And if you end up in a class of 25 with uh, 11 pupils with identified needs, then nothing is going to prepare anyone for being able to teach that. But it was something that Dr Ash had said uh, there that triggered me to indicate because you were talking about uh, the diverse nature of equalities and all the rest and one of our motions at our conference on uh, Saturday just passed was about uh, asking us to start looking into the diversity of entrants into the profession because they don't mirror the diversity of our nation um, and I think that we need I'm not I can't sit and say I you know I know exactly what each institution does to, to encourage, but there's an extreme lack of BME teachers across Scotland, teachers with disabilities, for instance, um, and children need role models as well as um, that, you know, making everything equal for everybody. So I would be quite interested in following up on, on what universities are doing to encourage a diverse background of trainee teachers, which again, I think would assist with a lot of the preconceived uh, notions of, of, of what additional support is as well as the other areas. Okay, thank you, Ross. Thanks. And just to, to go back to part of what I initially said, do you think it's accurate what we've heard so far from trainee teachers, that there is that level of inconsistency between their courses and their institutions? Jane? Well, I do, because that's what they report to us. Um, you know, we, we have students who come, sorry, they're new, newly qualified, who come from all over Scotland. And it's a chance for them to network together as well and discuss what their experience was. Um, and there was an extreme variation in how much of each thing. Obviously, you have to build in the student's perception of what they were getting. But I don't believe personally that there is a, a, a consistency across the board. And I recognise that work's being done to... Uh, change that, but I think we do need to look at what's being offered across the country. Just one, yeah, just one final question. Um, in terms of newly qualified teachers who are coming in and feeling underprepared to teach and support kids with additional support needs, how much of that is a lack of preparation in their training, and how much of it is that teachers are now entering schools where there are not the professional specialist staff that there used to be. There's not the support needs assistant that used to be there. So how much of it is their training and how much of it is a reduction in the staff that would have otherwise been supporting them? In the education they get in um, initial teacher education, there's always room for improvement. So I think it would be entirely complacent of me to be sitting here to say we could not do more. Of course we would and we can. So I think, yes, that bit of it can be improved. The, I think, yes, I think that the erosion that um, Jane was talking about and others have talked about because of pressures of, um, I mean, I, look, at, if you look at English as an additional language. I mean, we do have that. That population is growing in Scotland. And actually, the, all the support areas have been amalgamated. So these people who could have assisted, who would have handheld some of the teachers, who would have said, look, this is the how, this is the ways you can do it, they're, they're not there anymore. So actually this person coming out is becoming more and more a need to be multi-competent and multi-expert in a whole range of issues. And I think that's very scary. And I'm not surprised, therefore, some of the evidence you heard were from final year students coming in. And already people are nervous coming into a new profession and they understand those complexities. So all very understandable. But in terms of I can't be complacent, we as the provider could do more. 
across that. And I'd also say that um, it, we can't apportion blame to any one area. It's a society issue, to be honest, and we all collectively need to be working towards it. There's, all, there's more we could all do from that regard. Just bring to everybody's attention that, of course, our own student populations come with additional support needs now as they always have, but increasingly so. So the numbers of students we support with additional support needs is also increasing. Can I just clarify when you say that? Are you talking about teachers? Yes. But which kind of so initial goes teacher against education. what, what uh, Jane Peckham was saying? When Jane was saying that uh, there didn't seem to be teachers with additional support needs, etc. but you're saying that there are uh, a number of them going through the system. Uh, Absolutely. Um, Some, but there aren't, in, uh, there aren't enough. I, it sounds ridiculous. It's not a, a target. And yes, the numbers are very small and they're not visible when you're looking across the whole popu population of school. I'm okay, not saying there aren't any, yeah. but... I'm just talking about students, for example, with mental health difficulties. They, they form a significant um, number in our population now. Um, students who may have dyslexic difficulties. These are all issues that we yep. have to cope with initial teacher education that do reflect um, the standard population and are not necessarily visible. Yeah, I just wanted some clarity around it. Thanks very much. OK, thank you, Ross. Ruth? Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to ask you about placements. I mean, we've heard a, a little bit this morning. Um, in evidence last week and in the, the written evidence, it reflected that um, students' experiences were really quite different. And I was struck um, last week with one of the panel members saying that experience even within a school between departments had been uh, quite stark, starkly different for her and her um, student colleagues. So I'd like to hear, first of all, um, what sort of across your partnerships you can do to just ensure that the, the quality of the placements are, are high for all, all students? So the two bits. One is um, that I do think that, and, and what we've tried to do, because I can only speak from our example, is we put on, we developed a, a course, 24 hours, which is um, teachers give up, so teachers who are mentoring our students give up their time free, voluntarily to come to it, often on Saturdays or the evenings. But they, are, they can get accreditation for it, professional recognition, etc. Um, and they can trade it in for a master's credit at the end. But the point here was that we put on that particular course for our teachers supporting our students, because we realised that actually for the student, they need to actually be confident that the language that's being spoken in university and the language that's being spoken <laughs> in the school that they're being placed in, that though that is, it's not that it's got to be the same, but it's got to chime, I can't do is send people in two, three different directions, that there has to be an understanding of that partnership work, working in tandem. So that is an example of trying to bridge that experience to enable actually coherence and consistency for the student experience. That, um, I, just jump in yeah, and ask, sure. do you um, take feedback from oh, yeah. your own students? Oh, yes. And I suppose what I'd ask, what, what are the sort of things that they fed back to you that have made you change how placements are done or have made you um, take action on, on what's happening when, the, when they're within the, the school establishment? I don't know, Leslie, if you've got particular examples. I tend to pick up things when they go wrong in school, so in a sense I get a very um, skewed perspective of it. It is, every school context is different. Many of the teachers who support students in primary schools are not given any additional time to do that. So essentially they're doing it from a perspective of goodwill. In some secondary schools, our, our students are supported by student regents who have a more overarching role across the secondary school in supporting students. Sometimes that's the case in the primary school, sometimes it's not, and I think one of the things that would improve the situation would be if, if there was more time allocated to students, to, to mentor teachers officially to, to support our students. So um, we would be actually, I mean, I actually put this down here that I think I, we would be suggesting that there's a need for a service level agreement, actually, which recognises the work required of the school mentor, because it's, it is, by and large, they are given time, but it is a hit and miss. But I don't think it should be 
authority by authority. I think it should be a national one, which allow, which is drafted and agreed by the universities and local authorities, so that partners can sign up to it, and it shouldn't just be ad hoc. I would say there are huge challenges um, in, in this area. Uh, we have um, almost a quarter of our primary schools in Murray Council with a no head teacher or an acting head teacher at present, uh, and these head teachers are very often teaching um, a full week's class worth of teaching as well, uh, on top of having to lead and manage the school. And, and I think um, they very often see having a, a student teacher, and it's a great thing to have, um, but it is an additional burden just now. Uh, and and I, I would completely echo uh, what was said last week in that the practice is very, very inconsistent. And that's nobody's fault. Uh, we do put additional time into schools to allow them to mentor, but if they can't then get the backfill to cover, um, it's, 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 a, it's a meaningless gesture in many ways. So we've tried central mentoring in the past, where we've got one person mentoring across a local authority. But I actually that dilutes. I think that dilutes the experience a young per, uh, a young teacher gets, or a newly qualified teacher, or a student teacher indeed gets. Uh, so I think this is a huge challenge for us moving forward. I would add that the vast majority of our um, beginning teachers have very positive and very successful experiences on placement and. Um, due and large to the commitment of the profession, quite frankly. There's scope for improvement, but it's not to be forgotten. And sometimes I forget it, as I say, because I pick up all the difficulties. Um, and those placement experiences are jointly assessed by schools and teacher educators together, and students generally go smoothly through that experience and we're, are well prepared. I mean, I would add that I, I do recognise that we had some very positive um, feedback as well. But I guess whenever anything's relying on the goodwill of an individual rather than a, a sort of system, it, it feels it sort of rings alarm bells a bit. Yes. Um, and so apologies, Lawrence, because you're the only local authority person here, and I know it doesn't all fall to you. But but what can local authorities do to ensure that that there is the time within schools? Because I, I, I guess that's where it, the buck stops in, in many ways. It, it is, um, but I think until we have uh, really radically um, resolved the issues we have in terms of recruitment of teachers and supply teachers, I think it's going to remain a challenge. You know, five years ago we had um, 400 supply teachers on our books, so it was quite easy to, to, to use those teachers, um, to, to, to put them into a school, to release the head teacher or a senior member of staff, to mentor a student or to mention, mentor a newly qualified teacher. The number of supply teachers has halved, but we're at about the 200 mark, um, and, and most of these are being used to cover, um, you know, um, long-term, medium, short-term illnesses and absences and so on. So I think it's a real challenge for the system. Uh, we provide some central support, uh, but equally, over the past few years, we've reduced the size of our central team as well uh, in order to, to, to make efficiency savings and, and, and budget savings and so on. So I don't think there's an easy answer to it. But I think ongoing partnership working is, is, is essential. Working, again, I said earlier, with more local providers, so in our case, UHI, based on our doorstep uh, in Elgin, uh, and looking at what they can do, what we can do at the centre, and then what the schools can do, a kind of tripartite um, arrangement, that, that, that really has to be the way ahead. Okay. Jane. <laughs> at the risk of being the stroppy one in the corner, um, I think it's about time we stopped relying on the goodwill of people to bring through essential training and support for student teachers and for NQTs. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm not suggesting that people get remunerated with huge sums of money or anything else, but there has to be time dedicated to this um, and this sort of ad hoc approach. And I appreciate that local authorities have tried to put in um, centralised support, but it is down to the fact that there is no cover, there is no uh, supply. But for something as essential as supporting students, and, and every teacher was one at one point, um, to, to uh, get through their training and to get through their NQT and relying on the goodwill is just absolutely unacceptable. It really is. The other thing is that um, 
very, very strongly in favour of an opt-out for schools rather than an opt-in in terms of providing the placements, but equally recognising the specific issues of local authorities where you can't possibly, you know, so something has to be looked at that on a national basis to, to ensure that the amount of placements are available because there, there were massive issues in the last few years. And I do wonder, this isn't an official capacity, but whether perhaps some of the variation in standards resulted from the absolute relief that there was a placement in the first place that students could undertake. And I don't mean that in a critical way, but you know, it's particularly for postgraduates who have to do a really in-depth one year training, the fact that there isn't this availability is just scandalous. Okay, thank you. Claire? Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you, panel. Um, I'm struck listening to, to what you're saying this morning, how there are many similarities to teacher and teacher training to my own profession of nursing and nurse training, where there's you know, an academic part, but there's also a very skills-based as well, hands-on, practical Getting you know, getting your hands dirty, if 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 you like a way of 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 learning your your craft, um, but I, I, but I'm also struck by how uh, we heard from the the panel last week, where people were saying that sometimes their experience of having those placements in schools was not as good as it could be, and it sounded like a lot of the this. Uh, um, difficulties were through the administration of, of those placements, people being told at short notice schools were changing or that they were they weren't going to where they had expected to go. There was an expectation that people would travel quite quite some distance. Um, so can you tell me how the universities and local authorities liaise in terms of trying to make that transition from university into the classroom smoother for those teachers uh, in training? We certainly had extreme difficulties with placement um, this year. So the, the student placement database um, is now under the auspices of the General Teaching Council for Scotland. Um, the deans of education right across all of the universities came together this year to try to take action um, on the problems that had arisen and have reached agreement that there will be an opt-out from placement rather than an opt-in in the future. And we're very hopeful that that will improve the situation and prevent the last-minute um, arrangements that were required this year. Can you what that would mean in practice? Um, because I suppose when I hear opt-out, yeah. I'm concerned that there are perhaps schools, like, like in your, your own um, council, uh, Mr Finlay, that, that may well say, we don't have time to do this, so we will opt out, therefore you won't, you won't get teachers on placement, and so teachers won't be attracted to work in your local authority. I think the reasons for opt-out will be pretty limited next year, and that will be something, some crisis within a school that means it's unable to fully support students. Yes. I mean, if I can, can just come in here, um, we, I'm totally in favour of the, 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 the opt-out arrangements, uh, but it would be really an extremist, so it would be a school that perhaps only has two teachers, a two-teacher school, uh, and they were both going to be off, um, and we were struggling to get supply in to, to, to keep the school uh, afloat and to keep the school open, uh, and actually, what kind of experience would that be for the student teacher? Actually, it, it might be not a bad experience, because it does show them the reality of, of teaching in Scotland in the 21st century, perhaps, um, but, but I don't think that would be entirely fair uh, on, on, on a student teacher, but, but it would be that kind of situation, or a one teacher department uh, in a subject, say, like, like RME, where there's one teacher and they're going to be off um, ill for six months, um, what kind of experience will the student get? So that's when a, a school would, would opt out, and it does create some hassle, but it would be an abso absolute extremist. And, and, and in terms of liaison between local authorities and the, the universities or the colleges, how does that happen? Does that happen? How regularly are you in contact? Yeah, I, I, um, certainly I can only speak for my own authority, but I, I have a dedicated officer who leads on career-long professional learning, and uh, she's in regular contact with, with our, our two main providers, UHI and the um, University of Aberdeen. Um, and that's an ongoing discussion, ongoing dialogue, uh, probably on a weekly basis, uh, round about both the uh, initial teacher education, uh, but also the, the support that we're giving to, to NQTs and so on. So that's a, a, a very close uh, relationship. And also working closely with our schools as well, 
government looking at the expertise we have locally? So can we provide input on behaviour management? Can we provide input on ASN and so on? Uh, so, so, so it really is a, a very important partnership. Following the Donaldson report, all universities established partnership agreements with um, local authorities. So we have six such agreements with local authorities that surround Edinburgh. And Dr Arshad, from the beginning, actually, has led that group all the way through. So that provides regular meetings where we can discuss with local authorities and preempt problems, not only around placement, but around wider things as well. We've also in, in the, the School of Education, of course, we have a placement unit where staff are dedicated to interfacing with this um, GTCS practicum system that manages the allocation of placement. I know at Murray House as well, we took, took the initiative of appointing a member of staff um, to support me, actually, in the management of these placement issues this year as well. So we're trying to devote staff resource to it to make it as smooth running as as possible. But the fact remains, this year was the most challenging year I've ever seen in the allocation of placements in 15 years in teacher education. And uh, uh, do you have a rationale for why this was the most challenging year? It seemed to be a numbers game that schools were simply not coming forward and able to offer placements. So schools or local authorities? Schools. Schools. Okay. I think one additional thing in that mix maybe is that we have more diverse provision in teacher education, we've been encouraged to develop different models of teacher education with different placement patterns. So it's this kind of transition from the block placement system to different patterns of site-based learning in schools. And that change is quite difficult for the profession. And although we have employed development officers to go out into schools and to, if you like, educate schools about these differences. It is a process of, of change that is difficult. Daniel, you've got a, a short supplementary now. <laughs> uh, listen, um, and we are trying to get to the, the end of the session now, so could we both keep the questions short and the responses short, please? Thank you very much. Just in that last round of question, right at the beginning, you, you, you touched on feedback, and there was just a very specific comment about um, feedback from class reps and, and uh, how that was uh, acted upon at Murray House. And as a, a former student union education officer, it would be remiss of me not to ask you about that specific point. I mean, what, what are the structures and, and, and what would your comments be to that, those specific remarks that were made last week? Yeah. So it's, uh, you all know that we do, uh, you said, you asked, we did, you know, kind of thing, feedback. But what occurred to me from last week's evidence, and it's actually one that I subsequently wrote to Leslie about uh, last week, was actually sometimes what happens is that students will say something in year four, but they don't see the benefits of it because they're away. So actually, we need to actually do more about saying, your students from previous years said this, we can't do this, we can't do that, but we did this. What are you saying? So that, I think, is a comms issue as well. Thank you very much. Well, Tavish is a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Just, uh, Dr. Reid, just one supplementary to the answer you gave to Claire Hockey just now about the, the, this has been the biggest challenge on placements for 15 years. And therefore, but the show sure, sure, that you've experienced, um, uh, and you mentioned the change from blocks to something different. Could you describe that something different? Because is the problem or is, has been part of the problem that schools were used to uh, the blocks and therefore student trainees would be in for a period of time? I guess what you're arguing, you're telling the committee now is that's not the case, the, change, the system is changing. So it's yes. more challenging so, for schools so to accommodate students. In, in a desire to bring together theory and practice and that kind of divide is not one I really recognise, but you know, in, in a desire to integrate university-based learning and school-based learning, some of our degrees have ways of experiencing placement that means a student is going in every week to a school as opposed to just going there for a five-week yeah. block. So that's a very different model. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. The new MSc tilt that we're offering, the, the transformative learning and teaching degree, will have students in school for two or three days a week, as well as block placements. Okay. So our current MA primary degree has students in school for all of the, their third year. So that's a year-long placement. So diversity of provision is being encouraged by government. Universities have responded to that. Um, we've tried to work with the profession so that they understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
Um, but it, it, it is so, challenging for yeah. them to understand which, which programme yeah. is the student coming from I and what that. are the requirements. Yeah. Thank you. I get that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin. Thank you, Vera. Uh, one of the important uh, issues that we've been talking about are actually the retention of existing staff. And quite a number of reasons were given uh, by people giving evidence. It's, qu it's obviously quite complex. What do you think are the main reasons, the main barriers to retaining staff? Yeah, I think this is a really complex area. I, talking to um, people who've left the profession locally and, and looking at exit interviews and so on, um, th 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 there, are, there are myriad reasons why, why people are choosing to, to, to leave the profession. Um, one that certainly has been raised has been around about salaries and the competitiveness of salaries uh, compared to, to other professions. Uh, one has been uh, round about just the sheer demands and the one person um, referred to, to me as the, the never-ending um, churn and change of the last 13 years that had left them feeling a little bit powerless uh, as a teacher. In fact, I spoke to one principal teacher recently who's retiring at the end of this year who has many years service, over three decades of service, and she said that she actually felt uh, quite disempowered just she felt the changes had, she said we'd succeeded over the past 15 years in overcomplicating uh, teaching and learning and overcomplicating what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and she just felt really down about it. And that's why she was, she was bringing her retirement forward early. Um, and equally, I, I think if I look at from a head teacher's perspective, um, the head teachers that, that, that I work with in, in Murray are working ridiculous hours um, with uh, very, very um, poor staffing levels uh, due to the ability to recruit. Uh, and, and some people are just saying that they've had enough and they're actively choosing to leave the, the profession um, or to, to step down to a, a less demanding, non-promoted role, as they would see it. So I think there's a wide variety of reasons. That this, is a, this is a big uh, issue for our system, I think, to grapple with over the months and years ahead. Could I just pick up on one point yeah. you made there? What professions do teachers normally compare themselves with in terms of salary? Pass. I, I mean, I don't. Um, it's, it's just that. It's, it was just it's, you made the statement. Yeah, yeah, that I absolutely. Um, people haven't mentioned any specific professions to me, um, but they have mentioned that you know, graduate salaries compared to other uh, graduate salaries. So I haven't done any research into what other starting salaries are, um, but it's certainly been something that's been mentioned. Just to add to that, that actually it refers back to the STEM issue, that somebody who has a science degree is far more likely to go into some industry in terms of STEM than teaching because of the salaries. You know, that's one example of where they see. But in terms of what they compare themselves to, it's, uh, it will be the traditional uh, degrees that they always wear as professions, and law, law and so on. Um, so that's where they see the salary differentials. There also seems to be a um, lack of career opportunities for long-term progression in terms of the change in structure in the school, taking away the principal teacher role. Um, that seems to have had some possible impact. But once again, we need clear evidence on all of this. Um, you know, we've got pockets of evidence coming through, but we could do with some comprehensive evidence on retention and on recruitment and everything, really. There did seem to be something of a consensus in, in, in I think, uh, last week's panel um, as to where the salary issue was. It seemed to be in the early years. There seemed to be a consensus that later on it was much better, but in the initial period it was, it was quite tough. Um, between um, deputy head and head teacher level as well in terms of salaries. So we, we often, when we look at why we're struggling to recruit head teachers, um, we often hear um, anecdotal evidence from deputy head teachers in, in a large primary school, for example, who are paid more than the head teacher in a small rural primary school. So th they say, why would we take the £5,000 per year pay cut uh, for all the extra responsibility and hassle that goes with being a head teacher? So I don't think it's just at that big start of a career. I think it's up, it's up at um, deputy head into head teacher level as well. I mean, is it, this, this question of expectation, I mean, I, I come, you know, coming from the private sector, if I get paid £100,000 a year, I'd expect to work 12, 14 hours a day normally. What, what's the average uh, working day for a head teacher? I would say, uh, certainly from straw polls I've done locally, the, the, the average um, weekly uh, working week would be somewhere between 60 and 80 hours. Um, including significant weekend work and work during the school holiday periods. 
There was also, I think, a concern expressed about uh, lack of uh, um, recognition, lack, lack of uh, the profession being valued the same way as it used to be. Do, do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 we mentioned um, yeah. social media earlier, and, and, and one thing that's become very much a 21st century phenomenon is, is, is the notion of a teacher attack on social media, where, for, for whatever reason, a, a parent, or indeed a group of parents, um, take a, a dislike to a decision that a, a teacher, or particularly a head teacher, has made, uh, and, and um, run campaigns, sometimes covertly, I have to say, on, on social media. Uh, but these can be very damaging uh, to... Um, a head teacher or anybody, yeah. and I think exacerbated in a small rural area where everybody knows everybody as well, yeah. uh, and, and, and there are huge risks around about that, I think. Yeah. No teacher goes into the job for the money, that's, that's self-evident, um, and there are, there are huge issues around um, how the profession is valued, but where we have concern, we do a survey every year of our members across Scotland, and we compare them year on year, um, and uh, we, we look at the five things, you know, top five things they like about the job and the top five issues. But actually, and it's, it's the survey from last year, unfortunately, because the one that we did for 2007 is still being collated, and I'll happily submit it when it is. But three quarters of teachers in Scotland this year are seriously considering leaving their job, and 62% would leave the profession altogether. And I mean, that's a horrific st statistic because why are we training all our new and young people to come in? And the main reasons were, not surprisingly, workload being the top one. It's actually been uh, not been workload for a while. It was always uh, pupil behaviour or whatever. Um, so it's workload, curriculum changes, which are just an absolute nightmare at the moment. Pay, 51% have a concern about pay now. If you did that survey five years ago, teachers did not have the same levels of concern around pay, but they're now reaching almost a 20% deficit, so that's where they're starting to pay attention. And the fact that they now have to work till, well, who knows what it will be at the moment, it's 67, 68. And it's basically the lack of ability to progress beyond the main grade scale, because there's no uh, promotion, um, the restructuring into faculties, removing uh, principal teachers, removing, I mean, even things like shared headships. Where are people supposed to go? When it only takes them six or seven years to get to the top of the main scale. And they're going to have another 40 years to work on that. So there's no opportunity for them to develop in the way that they would wish. Uh, and that's notwithstanding the lack of uh, respect for their own judgment. But in terms of their own development, where is it they're supposed to go? So that's the main reasons at the moment why the profession is so dissatisfied. Um, so, so in terms of researchers looking elsewhere to say where are teachers in fact highly prized, and of course it'd be no surprise to you, Finland would be a classic example. They're talked up, so I think the key lesson for us, we've got to talk up this profession. We've got to think why it is that the Finnish teachers stay on. Um, they don't have the kind of bureaucratic, their autonomy levels are a lot higher. They don't have constant um, testing going on, all sorts of things. We've got to learn, and they are fairly high in the PISA ratings. Workloads are a consistent theme. Has there been any improvement in recent times? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, I had a recent meeting with Education Scotland because, as you know, through chat tackling bureaucracy, they're supposed to now be inspecting the measures that have put, put in place to manage workload. Um, again, we've challenged uh, the Cabinet Secretary to go back and have another look at it because uh, all of the recommendations are still being ignored largely by schools. Um, the workload is increasing rather than decreasing. And the changes to national qualifications, which we've been heavily involved in discussing, and we thought we actually had achieved something, um, although we were hesitant to begin with, until uh, we saw what the proposals were all going to be. Um, but the removal of unit assessments uh, for National 5 is a, is a huge bonus. However, um, the lateness of it happening and the fact that the National Four are now still having that there's still a fallback. Um, the whole thing's chaos and, and, and teachers are finding that uh, a lengthening exam is actually going to increase workload rather than decreasing it. So um, obviously we're all still working extremely hard 
uh, through the ANQ group to, to look at what else can be done and to minimise. Um, but, you know, there are areas where we've got members who are actually taking action short of because it's the only way that they can restrict their workload. And I mean, it's not an exaggeration that there are primary members doing 75 hour weeks and it's through pressure from their management who are also being pressured from the employer to meet the, the, the statistics and all the different things. And I mean, the, the, they're basically crumbling now. So um, unless something is seriously done to address it, I think we're in for, for chaos. So teacher workloads, obviously, can, 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 can. Um, can I just ask, the, the statistics that you're quoting there, is, is this from the NAS UWT Big Question 2016? Yes. Okay. And who was that conducted over? Who was that? This is your own... Our own membership yeah. across the whole of Scotland. Okay. And what is your membership across we Scotland? We have over 7,000 now. Okay. And what proportion of the uh, teaching profession is that? Oh, it's about 15%. About 15%, okay. And included in that, there were um, newly qualified teachers yeah, and students. Yeah, across all student sectors. Teachers, um, well. Not students, no. Not students. Newly qualified and, and above. It's so newly qualified and above. Okay, thank you. Can, can I just clarify one thing? When you, you talked about the, the teachers being under pressure from the schools and from their employers, etc. Who are their employers? Well, from local authorities, largely. An example would be the introduction of the literacy and numeracy benchmarks came in in August. So everything else in terms of assessment for literacy and numeracy was supposed to go in terms of assessing a level. And we've been dealing with individuals uh, in, very, in a couple of authorities, individual management, uh, where they've basically said, no, I've spent a lot of work doing this. This is what we're doing. Now, this is a direction from Scottish Government that, and Education Scotland that this the benchmarks are to be used because they were designed to reduce and simplify the assessment of a level, and schools are just ignoring it. So it's something that we're taking forward, obviously, through other avenues, but it has to be looked at seriously um, in terms of the changes are being brought in for a reason, and they should be adhered to. Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanne, on this point? Yeah, it's, it's on this question of um, retention. Is it a is there an early dropout rate from people just newly to the profession and then perhaps people later on cashing in their retirement early? Or what balance is there between the two? I'll come in first here, if that's OK. I think there's a, a, a bit of a mixture here. And it goes back to something we said earlier about the fact that, that the notion of a job for life is, is, is disappearing fast. Um, so whereas 10, 20 years ago, somebody would graduate and they'd be a teacher till they retired uh, and move up through the profession um, in, in, in that manner has gone. So we often have... A, newly qualified teachers who are quite open about the fact that they will do their NQT year, they will teach with us for a couple of years, then they want to go and do a second gap year or go travelling or shift profession. But they very often are quite clear as well that they want to return to teaching at a later point. Um, you know, after doing other things. And I think that's becoming more common uh, in the workplace. So uh, we're also seeing an increase in people um, now choosing to take a career break halfway through their careers, maybe in their mid-40s or even, you know, into their 50s, just to take a year or two years out to do something different and then, then to come back. So I don't think there's um, anything you can, we can pinpoint in terms of um, <coughs> pressure points at when people are leaving the profession. I think there's, there's a fair mixture. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. so we get that the world has changed yeah. and the idea that you go school, university, school is, is changed. However, are there specific pressures that are now coming on teachers and making them think, which is what the suggestion from um, uh, Jane is, and uh, frankly, evidence fr reflected in a lot of the evidence come to committee. Yeah. When you can I just get an answer to this question about workload? Because I think there's a thing about the amount of work you have to do as a professional but to what extent is that ability to focus on your workload, whether you're a head teacher or a classroom teacher, um, challenged by the fact that you're also having to cover for somebody who's not in because you can't get in supply, or you haven't got a classroom assistant, or you haven't got a um, support teacher, or you haven't got somebody that basically does the admin round preparing your worksheets or whatever. Maybe we don't do worksheets anymore, I don't know. <laughs> but that kind of... When I think of the physical support that I would get to yeah. deliver a lesson, it allowed me to focus on my teaching yeah. and to what extent, because I think we can talk about workload and the difficulties of actually 
the other things that are being cut in schools, to what extent is that impacting on people's ability to stay and actually be focusing on their job? In terms of what we've done in, uh, with the research for our members, it's having a huge impact. It is one of the main drivers of increasing workload, is the stripping away of all the additional resources. I mean, obviously, teaching is not a job that you can put down and walk away from mm -hmm. at four o'clock every day and go back to at nine. And, and I mean, teachers recognise that. But when, when the 35-hour week was originally introduced back at the beginning of, the, of, of this century, it reduced the average teacher's working week to around the 48-hour mark from the high 50s. And what we're now seeing is it's rising and rising and rising. And it's, I mean, it's accumulation of things. It's a lot to do with things needing done that other people would have done before. Um, but there's also an expectation of, you know, an, inspecting, an inspection in a school three weeks into term does not require the walls covered with the children's work. The children have only been at school for three weeks of a, a new academic year, and no HMI inspector would expect that. But the school is asking for that to be produced by the teachers and so on. It's this unnecessary bureaucracy, um, and it's difficult to challenge it in, in all aspects, but that's what's having the most impact, mm. this compulsion to meet the needs. Mm. And can I ask about the retention of students? Um, I mean, I think that the fact that I can just see somebody being given the responsibility to be a mentor, and they're under the caution. In fact, we got it from our group last week that people didn't complain because they could see that people were doing their best to mentor them. What provision is there within the, the, those who provide an initial teacher education to have an, a policy where people feel that they can report back on what their experience of a placement was without feeling that they were somehow letting down folk who were doing their best for them. I mean, way back in the day, my first teaching um, placement, I just got put in with a class because somebody hadn't turned up. Now, the last thing I did was to complain to the college at the end of it because they were very good to me during that period. So how do you manage to get the space where people can be honest about a placement without it being somehow condemning the schools who are doing their best under difficult circumstances? It's very challenging. Um, we have to work very sensitively with our partner schools on this. Um, we have to explain to students that a placement, in a sense, has to be good enough for them to achieve the learning they need to achieve on that placement and to take professional responsibility for <laughs> liaising with other staff in school if they're in difficulties. So we would expect a student to, if they're having difficulty with the relationship with the mentor teacher, first of all, maybe to go to the deputy head in school or the head if necessary, if that's not working. Um, students have varying levels of support while they're on placement. So all of our students have a personal tutor who looks after not only their academic development, but their pastoral care. Um, in addition to that, they have a placement tutor who um, visits them on placement and supports them. In addition to that, they have the programme director um, who looks after their whole experience in initial teacher education. So there are lots of different routes for support and different students find it easier to access one or other form of support. Mm -hmm. It tends to be relationship based. So if they have a good relationship with their personal tutor, they may go there first. Um, ultimately, it would all come to me as Director of Undergraduate Studies if there was a problem that wasn't resolved. But there is close dialogue between the Programme Director, for example, and the school if a student is in difficulty. How do you stop a young people, a student, a, a young person, yeah. it would not just be a young person, but somebody training, learning, um, getting a teacher education, being inhibited from being honest about what their experience was because the school report might work against them? How, what yeah, are the checks and yeah. balances? Because there's quite a, an imbalance in power around that process. There is, there definitely is. And an assurance with the, um, with the student that they will be supported in their learning and that they have a right to the learning they need to do when they're in school. So it is a very sensitive thing. I think we could get better, Joanne, at that because I do think that safe spaces to actually just come and share. It's not mm -hmm. a complaint, mm -hmm. it's sharing. 
And it's actually sometimes also a space to share, hey, I wouldn't be doing this this way. So, uh, I think students are incredibly loyal, incredibly professional, like you were when you were a student teacher. They are the same now. What we have to do is actually help them, I think, to have the spaces to simply talk about these things. Uh, actually, it's important because if we don't want them to actually start walking after the first couple of years, we need to actually allow those spaces. So, yeah. yeah. Experience tells me that one route isn't the answer, that because it's relationship-based, they often have to have a variety of people to call upon. So that, Jolene. Pick up on something that Jim Peckham just said about school inspections and about unnecessary bureaucracy. We've had the inspector in here, as you'll know, a few times, and they are, are really wanting to get the message to individual schools that what you're describing about having, you know, uh, the place redecorated for the inspection is actually not what they're looking for at all. Yet, yet it's still happening in individual schools, and I'm wondering what steer the local authority can be given to their schools to stop this unnecessarily work. Work, workload that I think there's still a mindset that, that, that within schools that they have to be maybe going by the way that inspectors used to. Uh, the world smells a fresh plane is the phrase that we hear time and time again. Yeah, we, we give all our schools quite a clear steer <coughs> in terms of what the expectations will be of, of inspection uh, and that they are not expecting you know tractor loads of box files with mm -hmm. uh, pieces of paper in them and posters all over the wall and so on. Um, so that information is put out loud and clear to, to head teachers. Of course, what individual head teachers do with that, it, it, it's at their discretion. Why is, it, why is it still happening? Because some people are still choosing to do it. Despite the putting extra stress on, their, on, their, on yeah. their colleagues by, by having that mindset. Yeah. How, can we, how can we stop that? Well, I actually think that some of the, um, the, the tryouts that Education Scotland are carrying out, such as the short notice inspection, is, is having an impact. So previously, when you had three weeks notice, but well, you still have three weeks notice for an inspection, two weeks um, for, for um, some schools, um, that, that's a lot of time to panic and to get the school smelling of fresh paint yeah. and looking good. If you get the phone call on the Thursday saying the inspectors are coming on Monday, that really focuses the mind on what really matters in terms of you know, your own self-evaluation and selling the story of your school. So I think that moving towards short notice inspections will, will help greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm now just going to bring the session to a close. I'd like to thank you all very much for your full contributions uh, and your patience in dealing with all our questions. Uh, and I will close the public session. Yes, close the public session. <laughs>